that the consciousness that could assert its life, even when you simulate death, must be something other than the body. But the practitioners of meditation have refined that more. They say, don't only simulate by stiffening the body. Become unconscious of the body. Because the Lord has given us a wonderful gift called human attention. Heard of that? Human attention is that which enables us to choose our experience. I don't want to look at that wall. I want to look at that wall. I can turn my attention there. This ability which human beings have of turning their attention to one thing helps them to withdraw attention from something else. What would happen if we gave our attention to our own self within and ignored the body? The attention will be withdrawn from the body onto our own self. What would happen if we simulate that we are a conscious being inside the body but not the body and withdraw our attention on to that simulated self, the conscious self, which is not the body, we will gradually become unaware of the body. Gradually, first we will not know where the hands have gone, where the feet have gone, then the limbs have gone, and the trunk has gone, and then we won't know where the body has gone, and we will be very much alive, conscious and kicking. Try it out. Any one of you can do it. All the practitioners of meditation do it. That's called dying while living. You are still alive, but have become unconscious of the body and therefore found out what you would be if you had no body. When you do that, you find that your ability to see, touch, taste, smell remains intact. Therefore, people have said there is another body. Even if you did not have the physical body, you can still walk about, talk, touch, see, hear, taste, touch. That means all these sensory perceptions remain intact even without the physical body. When you let the attention come back into the physical body, you find that this body can see, hear, taste, touch, smell because of that body, not because of this. That the power to perceive through senses all the time belong to another body, not to this. But since you are using this body, you were misidentifying all those capacities to perceive with the physical body. What a great discovery one can make, merely by dying while living. When you find that body, which sometimes is referred to as a sensory body or the astral body, and you want to go further, is this astral body me or is there something deeper? Die in the astral body by living. That means withdraw your attention from the astral sensory perceptions, from all the sense perceptions, on to the self, the conscious self, which claims these are my senses. When you withdraw your attention to the core of that astral body, you find you can become completely unaware, unconscious of the astral system, of the sensory systems. You can be absolutely unaware. And still you can see and hear and grasp mentally. You suddenly find that the mind outlives even the sensory building, the sensory system. That means the mind or a mental body or causal body which causes these phenomena to happen is even deeper, outlasts the sensory body. So you discover you have a still more durable inner body called the causal body or the mind. There is no difference between the two. The mind, when it encloses us, is called the causal body. When it is applied and we don't see the causal body, it is called the mind. It's the same thing. What happens if you allow the mind to die and you remain conscious? If the self that is using the mind says, let me withdraw my attention from thoughts. Let me withdraw my attention from reasoning. Let me withdraw my attention to myself and let me forget the mind. You become unconscious of the mind. When through this deep meditation, you become unconscious of the mind, you are more conscious of yourself than ever before. And for the first time you realize that your consciousness was not dependent either on the mind or the senses or the physical body. Anybody can do this, provided you go in the right direction, the right path within, not outward. If you take your attention continuously out of yourself, how can you have any of these experiences? But the moment you reverse this direction and go in the right path within yourself, 
you can have the experience of doing without the physical body still being alive and more alive, doing without the sensory body still being alive and more conscious, and doing without the mind and still being alive and more conscious. Then what happens? For the first time you have a legitimate right to claim, I know who I am, I am the soul. I was never the mind. I wasn't the body. I wasn't the senses. I was my soul. But when you say my soul, that means you are not even the soul. Who is it claiming I am my soul? Who is that? Somebody is even still claiming, asserting, this is my soul, like it was claiming this is my body. So you cannot be the soul either. Now what is left? You have removed all these covers, taken off the garments, become a naked soul. Still it is crying, I am something that has the soul. Who has the soul? What part of consciousness is still left? That is still being deluded by the soul. The last unseen and subtle cover which is still making us separate and still makes us claim it is my soul is called the cover of individuation. What makes us an individual soul that itself is unreal. When this individuation and individuality is also removed by withdrawing attention to pure consciousness, not to the individuated consciousness. You find there was indeed always one consciousness, the total consciousness. There never were so many. We created the illusion of the many to have an experience of a dramatic creation. That the truth was one single undivided indivisible consciousness. You call it God, you call it total soul, you call it totality, call it what you will, it's immaterial. Then you have thrown away the last of the illusions. At that time you find everything that exists and everything that is created is you. That this is illusion which created the walls between one and another. Now tell me, if you have even a glimpse of this experience once, for one fraction of a second, can you be the same people again? Can you after this experience, even for a moment, not love? Laugh, enjoy the whole of creation. Can you ever see any enemies around you after this? Can you ever see anybody other? One of the mystics in India was asked, Who do you like and who don't you like? He said, How can I like or dislike anybody else when there is nobody else? Where is that other person? Where is that other somebody else? The truth is there is no somebody else. How can I like or dislike somebody else? When does this knowledge come? When consciousness of human being, available right now, can transcend the covers which it thinks it is self and rise to the glory of an experience of totality. And that comes through these stages when we can rise to our own totality, our own reality. Then we can say we are self-realized. At that time, there is no distinction between self-realization and God-realization. There is no difference left between the self and the creator. Because there is only one. There never were two. When I was young and I was taught the way to go on the path to my father's home, a strange philosophy was propounded. And that was, you are a soul, a drop from the ocean, separated from the ocean. Try hard and go back and merge in the ocean, which is your father full of love. I thought to myself, I said, good grief, today I am a drop, I have a personality, an individuality, I have at least a drop, and I am supposed to go and merge in the ocean, it will make no difference to the ocean whether it gets one more drop or not, and I lose everything I have. What kind of game is this? The spiritual path is no good. That I lose the dropwood that belongs to me and merge in an ocean to which it makes no difference. But I was wrong. And those who think we are drops of the ocean, separated from the ocean, are also wrong. For the simple reason, if a single drop is taken from the ocean, it can no longer remain the total ocean. And if it is not the total ocean, it is no longer God. Do you realize God is totality? with nothing missing from it. 
if one soul happens to escape, it not only destroys God, it destroys everything. It destroys totality. Therefore, as I grew up and understood the path better, I found it is true I am a drop. It is true I am a drop in the ocean. But it is untrue that I left the ocean. The truth is, I am a drop of consciousness in the ocean of total consciousness, but I never left the ocean. What did I leave? I left the awareness of being in the ocean. Now what happens? If I am already in the ocean, as a drop of that ocean, and the spiritual path takes me back into my awareness, I become one with the ocean. The drop enlarges its personality to its truth or totality, which is the total ocean. Made sense? Immediately. You go and look at the ocean. What is it except drops? Are there no drops of water all put together? How big are the drops? As big as your awareness will make them. Look at them as tiny drops. They are tiny. Now look at them. Bigger drops, they become bigger. See, the bigger, bigger, the whole thing becomes one drop. The whole ocean is one drop. It's the awareness, the expansion of awareness, the realization of the totality that gives you the truth. Therefore, the spiritual path is not a path that takes you anywhere else except into your own totality. And as you leave the illusions of your covers one by one, you discover the truth. People are today coming to me in large numbers, young people in universities. I sometimes marvel. They invite me to new kinds of organizations. The Spiritual Frontiers Fellowship which invited me has four more called the New Age Movement. So many things. They said, here is a guy, he talks our language, he has brought the message for the new age, but I am bringing the old message. Of course, if you like it in a new bottle, I'll put the old wine in a new bottle and pack it for you. You call it new age, call it. But it is the same path, the same message. Every age will need it. The new age needs it more than ever before. Because we have reached the brink of being overwhelmed by the mind. The mind likes analysis. Analysis means breaking. Breaking means violence. The soul likes synthesis. The soul likes oneness. The soul likes peace. The new age needs the old path more than ever before. I hope any one of us who is given attention by the new age will rejoice in the fact that the turn of the century will see a real new age when we will give up the mind and return to our own souls and through the souls, to the totality of our souls, which will give each one of us everlasting love, beauty, joy and happiness. Thank you very much. Yes. Does that mean that we are more capable of the inner worship? No. Nobody is incapable of inner worship. Nobody is incapable of this true spiritual path. But what happens is that so habituated is mankind to taking its attention outside that even the Lord sitting inside waiting for us has to jump outside. Look guys, you don't want to see me inside. Here I come outside. Therefore, like the son of God, like a master, they appear outside to take us back inside. This has happened in every country, everywhere in the most hostile circumstances. Even where these things are not allowed, even there, in some form or the other, the Lord has appeared in such human form that we could experience love. Now, let me tell you, worship is great, prayer is great, but not the equivalent of love. If God came as God and sat upon a pedestal, you could worship God. You could pray to that God, but you could not love. Why? You can only love when you can hold the hand and say, what are you doing to me when I am in distress? When you have a friend, when you have somebody who is like you. We had a very interesting mystic in Persia. And he has described the story of a mother whose child refuses to listen to her. And they have a small house with a ceiling on top with no walls around to protect. There is a small ladder to go up. The child thinks 
that the mother is chasing him in a game of hide and seek and he runs up the ladder and goes to the ceiling the mother says don't go up you'll fall you'll hurt yourself so she runs up after him he goes to the edge of the roof and she says don't move any further you'll fall he laughs he thinks it's a big game going on so he steps on the edge and as the mother takes even one step he moves further to the edge she says this child is not going to come back he is going to slip and die so she tries to engage this child in conversation you know come back and she gives various stories and incentives to him but he doesn't come when she moves cleverly forward the child notices there's a pipe jetting out a drain pipe to convey the water out from the top of the roof the child jumps onto the pipe and hangs on it now the mother is convinced sooner or later he must fall so she says now it's dangerous come back it's dangerous you will fall hurt and kill yourself child laughs says yes yes catch me if you can when she moves now he slides to the edge of end of edge of the edge of the pipe the end of the pipe so that it is really dangerous now for the child the mother doesn't know what to do the mother is worried call the child back says you are in great jeopardy in danger child laughs and says yes yeah, a good game at that time a young man passes by he says ma'am why are you so worried and she says look at my child he is at the edge of this pipe if i take one step he falls he doesn't listen to me i am so worried for him i can't save him that young man says ma'am don't worry i'll tell you a method by which you can get the child to come back come down forget the child let him hang for a while you come down the ma'am mother comes down and the child says don't you have little kids of the age of your own child somewhere in the neighborhood she says of course my neighbor's child is the same age as my own son he says go and bring your neighbor's child give him a toy in his hand take him up and don't even look at your child just set this other child on top of the roof and give him a toy to play with then watch what happens she runs brings the neighbor's child takes him on top puts him on the roof and gives that little toy when her child looks at the other child coming he crawls back gradually comes to the child to play and the mother picks him up the mystic giving the parable says we are like the little child that mother is our god we are facing the danger of falling into the dungeons of this world and we think it's a big game we don't care the mother calls us day and night through church through temple through radio through television god's message is coming we don't take it seriously we take it as a game when do we take it seriously and are saved when somebody like us comes with whom we can play and all he has got extra than us is a toy to play with therefore god himself must become like the little child and play with him before he will realize that he has to come and be saved because through love and playfulness alone will god save us this story illustrates that although the truth lies within us although we can worship within but not knowing the way of worship not knowing the way of going within we await the son of god the master the teacher the enlightened one somebody who is ahead of us in this path to come and tell us the way what does he say come on follow me the way is inside you why couldn't we go inside till he came I have never seen anybody going inside till somebody outside came and then he went inside therefore this game is wonderful it is available to all humanity but some have the advantage of one step ahead than the others we are all walking on the path some may have crossed others some may get overtaken later on but we are going on when the time is right when we are ready circumstances and coincidences will come to create an opportunity for us create a master for us who will tell us the way to go with it this has been the experience of mankind when they are ready the true master who can help them comes and comes and walks and talks in their midst out of circumstances and coincidences
Therefore, let us do our job to be ready for it. We can't do the job of finding the master, of finding who can help us, of finding the true savior. If we go into that search, we will end up in a mental effort. If we prepare ourselves in our own hearts and fill the heart with love, truly, the Lord himself in one form or the other will appear as the master. In India we say, when the chela is ready, the guru appears. They don't say, when you are ready, find a master. They say, when you are ready, the master will appear. If the master does not appear and doesn't know you are ready, he is no master. Obviously. And if he does appear, he will reveal to you that he is a master by what are called private miracles. It will be so miraculous that when you tell your friends, look, this was a strange thing that happened. All my questioning, all my preparation in life is now answered because now I found this by a strange miracle it happened to me. What will the friend say? Now, don't be stupid. That's no miracle. That was just a coincidence. Because coincidences are the greatest vehicles of personal miracles that mankind has ever known. Therefore, don't underestimate coincidences. When things happen coincidentally for you, something great is happening. And if you are on the spiritual path, you will find the more intensely you walk on the spiritual path, the larger the number of coincidences that will happen in your life. So remember, there are two languages spoken in this universe. The mind's language spoken in words in your head and the Lord's language spoken around you throughout by circumstances and coincidences. When you see a circumstance or a coincidence, remember that's the Lord giving you a message. Everywhere you will get it, whichever country you belong to. Yes? About the devil? I have been speaking about the devil all the time. I never use his name. His other name is our mind. We carry, we carry with us the individuated essence of the devil just as we carry within us the individuated essence of God. The individuated essence of God in us is called soul. The individuated essence of devil in us is called mind. I have been talking about the devil all the time. But the devil doesn't let himself be recognized. Yes. Um, when we're paying attention to coincidence and chance, that I realize, I've noticed that in my own paying attention that sometimes it looks wonderfully and it's very free, and other times I feel myself getting interested in things that border on my. Or yes, coincidence and circumstance are the language of the Lord, but what is the hearing end? When the Lord speaks, who hears? You can either let your mind hear or you can let your soul hear. When you let your mind hear, it becomes superstition, suspicion, doubt, uncertainty and subject to rejection. If you let the soul hear, you will hear it intuitively, by hunch, gut knowledge. Therefore, when you want to take a decision for yourself, based on the circumstances around you, use your gut knowledge, your intuition, that flash of knowledge which comes about that. That's the reaction, go ahead. It doesn't fit in with your rationalization, doesn't matter. But if you start rationalizing then, no, it could be like that, what am I doing? That's the mental response to it. Then the coincidence and circumstance loses its validity. Yes, you have a very efficient mind. The mind is doing a good job. Yes, therefore, give due praise to your mind. Say, give praise, credit. Say, mind, you have done a good job. Now let me do mine. Let the mind do its own job and let him rest there. Say, now let me do mine. Therefore, a question was asked to me that if a coincidence comes, who interprets? The mind interprets. And I said, if the mind wrongly interprets and you are cautious, conscious of that, the coincidence will happen again. 
and again and again till the message is taken up by you other than your mind. Therefore, when this happens and you come to know that the mind is giving you the advice, say thank you, now keep it aside. As you know, it's not difficult to recognize the mind. Whatever thinks is the mind. Simple. If it comes by thinking, it's the mind. Keep it aside. If you find this is it because you have not thought about it, accept it. Yes? Pardon? Spirit is the soul. The soul I speak of is the same as the spirit. Yes? No. The, did you say the mind is bad? Let me correct it. In the Bible, in the beginning, if you read the original part, the mind has been described as Lucifer. The Lord of the sunrise has also been described as one of the archangels. You know, there were only two archangels to start with. There were only two archangels. The mind has been called even an archangel. Why? Because the mind, unless it does this negative thing of stopping you from yourself, is not evil. If you use the mind as a slave, the mind is very good. If you allow yourself to be used by the mind, it's a very bad master. Which reminds me of the story of Aladdin and the lamp. Have you heard that? You heard the story of Aladdin and the lamp? There was a young child. He found a lamp. When he rubbed the lamp, a big genie appeared. So he he was frightened to see that big genie. And the genie said, I am your slave. Command what I can do for you. And the little child, Aladdin, was so scared of that. He said, go and go outside and make a big house. When the building is ready, then come back to me. So the genie disappeared. And within a couple of minutes, he was back again. He said, the house is ready. Command what I shall do. He said, this is a very efficient genie. So he said, go and make a big bridge over the whole ocean. Then only come back. Don't come before completing the bridge. In a few minutes, the genie was back. The bridge is ready. Command what I shall do. This little child was out of command so soon. The genie was so efficient. Ultimately, he said, do what you like. And the genie said, all right, come on. Now we will do what I like. And he began to drag Aladdin with him wherever the genie liked. This guy who got this little Aladdin, who got a genie as a slave, became the slave of the genie and genie became the master. He was so efficient. Then one day, Aladdin saw one of his friends on the way. And the friend said, Aladdin, you used to be such a happy-go-lucky guy. What's happened to you? You look so sad. He said, I am very sad. I found a strange, efficient guy who is this big slave of mine. He is so efficient that he is taking me wherever he likes. I am out of commands. That friend said, is that what's happening? So hearing the story of Aladdin, he said, look, next time the genie asks you, what shall I do for you? Command, say, go and bring a wooden pole from outside. When the genie has brought the wooden pole to you, say, now genie, dig this pole in the center of this room. And when he has dug the pole there, and he says, command what I shall do, say, genie, now go up and down, up and down this pole till I give you the next command. Keep him on that pole, up and down, up and down. Whenever you want to do something, tell the genie, stop going up and down, do this job for me. When he has finished doing it, bring him back, say, now on the pole, up and down, up and down. These mystics and masters told us, the mind is like the genie. We are Aladdin. That mind was given to us to serve us, to work for us, to be used by us. What did we do? It was so efficient, we made the mind our own master. Instead of our giving any commands to the mind, the mind is telling us where to go. The thoughts drag us where they like. We don't direct our thoughts. Therefore, the mind has become our master. The spiritual guides tell us to deal with the situation. Go and buy a little pole and put it behind your eyes, in the head. The pole of repetition of a mantra, of some holy words. Why? 
when the mind says what next say go on repeating these words up and down up and down the pole when you want to use the mind take it to thinking complete your job bring it back back on the pole of repetition up and down up and down mind is good as a slave bad as a master okay thank you very much i enjoyed being with you thank you, thank you.